Carbon and oxygen are two elements which are critical to supporting life. And these two elements are intimately linked by the process of photosynthesis. This relationship is also evident in the geologic record. In these two figures, I'm showing the delta 13C of marine carbonates and atmospheric oxygen levels for the last three and a half billion years. Delta 13C is essentially the ratio of carbon 13 to carbon 12, with more carbon 13 resulting in the in higher delta 13C. When we look at the oxygen curve through time, we can see that atmospheric oxygen rises in two major steps. First, in the Paleoproterozoic, during what is called the Great Oxidation Event, and a second time during the Neoproterozoic, during what is called the Neoproterozoic Oxygenation Event. This figure shows that these major oxygenation events coincide with positive carbon isotope excursions in marine carbonates. When we look at the delta 13C curve, we can see that for most of Earth history, delta 13C has a baseline of around 0 per mil. So whenever delta 13C deviates from 0, we call it a carbon isotope excursion. There is a reason to explain why increases in atmospheric oxygen are accompanied by positive carbon isotope excursions. Atmospheric CO2 is removed in two forms, inorganic carbonate, which has a relatively high delta 13C of around 0 per mil, and organic carbon, which has a low delta 13C of around minus 25 per mil. The ratio of total carbon that is buried as organic carbon is called F-org, and when F-org increases, more carbon is buried as organic carbon, which raises oxygen to the burial of photosynthetic products. Increases in F-org also increase the delta 13C of marine carbonates because organic carbon is preferentially, organic carbon preferentially takes up carbon-12, which depletes the uh, carbon-12 in the carbon pool from which marine carbonates form. So increased F-org is one possible ne mechanism to drive the coupled increase of atmospheric oxygen and the positive carbon isotope excursions observed in the Proterozoic. And while the mechanism of increased F-org driving positive carbon isotope excursions and oxygenation events is scientifically sound, some research has brought it into question. For one, some studies have shown that oxygen may have begun to rise prior to the onset of the carbon isotope excursion, making it difficult to explain both events with increased F-org. Additionally, these positive carbon isotope excursions are extremely long-lived lasting for hundreds of millions of years, and it has been difficult to provide any biological mechanisms to sustain increased F-org for such long periods of time. Time scales of hundreds of millions of years align better with processes occurring in the mantle's deep carbon cycle and are on the same magnitude of mantle overturn times. So for the rest of the presentation, I'll be talking about a model which uses carbon cycle process occurring in the mantle to explain the coevolution of carbon and oxygen at Earth's surface. So here I'll talk about how we can increase oxygen with no carbon isotope excursion. So the main process that controls the flux of carbonate production is the weathering of continental rocks, which deliver cations such as calcium and magnesium to the oceans, which stimulates the precipitation of carbonates. This weathering flux is sensitive to atmospheric CO2 and the weatherability of rocks, which is controlled by composition, land area, and precipitation, among other things. So if the weathering flux increases, the carbonate production flux also increases. The production, the production of organic carbon is also controlled by nutrients such as phosphorus, which are derived from continental weathering. So enhanced continental weathering can increase production of both carbonate and organic carbon. And if they increase proportionally, then there's no change in F-org to accompany the increased burial of organic carbon and rise in atmospheric oxygen. Subsequently, organic carbon and carbonate are buried on the seafloor and subducted deep into the mantle, which is where we propose the carbon isotope excursion originates. So after being subjected to the elevated temperatures in the mantle, organic carbon will metamorphose to graphite. So here I show how graphite and carbonate behave differently in the mantle. This figure on the right shows how much of the originally subducted organic carbon 
how much of the originally subducted carbon will remain in the subducting slab as a function of pressure, which can be thought of as how deep the slab has it subducted into the mantle. This figure is generated from high pressure experiments conducted on graphite and carbonate under mantle conditions. And the black curve shows graphite retention, while the red and blue curves show carbonate retention. This figure shows that carbonate is more efficiently released from subducting slabs compared to graphite. And what this means is that carbonates subducted into the mantle are more easily recycled back to the surface compared to graphite, which opens up the possibility of driving carbon isotope excursions by fractioning graphite and carbonate in the mantle. So here's a schematic diagram to outline the mechanisms for driving carbon isotope excursions by deep carbon cycle processes. This shows a cross section of the earth with three different volcanic centers, mid-ocean ridges, arc volcanoes, which receive significant contributions from materials removed from the subducting slab, and ocean island volcanoes, which are thought to be fed by upwelling mantle plumes, which carry material from the deep mantle and often contain subducted slabs. Mid-ocean ridges are thought are mostly sourced from depleted upper mantle, and this is thought to contain mostly primordial carbon, which has a delta 13C of around minus five per mil. And most previous research has used this value of around minus five per mil for all volcanically emitted CO2, and assumed that this value never changes. However, this may not be the case. As shown in the previous slide, at subarc conditions, carbonate is more easily removed from the subducting slab compared to graphite. Therefore, arc volcanoes are likely to be enriched in carbonate-derived CO2, which has a delta 13C of around 0 per mil. Therefore, arc CO2 is likely to have delta 13C <laughs> greater than minus 5 per mil. So if the arc flux increases, then the delta 13C of global CO2 emissions will increase and initiate a positive carbon isotope excursion. Now, after subducting past subarc depths, the slab will have lost most of its carbonate and now will be relatively enriched in gravitized organic carbon. These deeply subducted slabs may then become entrained in upwelling mantle plumes and contribute to ocean island volcanism, releasing the subducted organic carbon. This will result in a spike of CO2 emissions with delta 13C less than minus 5 per mil. And this will decrease the delta 13C of global CO2 emissions and will terminate the positive carbon isotope excursion and possibly even drive a negative carbon isotope excursion. So now that I have outlined the mechanism for driving carbon, carbon isotope excursions via deep carbon cycling, I want to share some results from a box model we developed to account for these behaviors of carbon in the mantle. I won't go into too much detail on all the flux and fluxes and reservoirs in the, man, in the model, but I will outline some of, the more, some of the important assumptions of the model. First, the carbonate burial flux is controlled by the equation K times CO2 to the nth power, where K is a variable which accounts for how weatherable the continents are, and CO2 is the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. F org is always kept at 0 0.2 throughout the model, and atmospheric oxygen is proportional to the amount of organic carbon in all reservoirs. CO2 released at mid-ocean ridges is always minus 5 per mil, and CO2 released at arcs is heavily influenced by the delta 13C of subducted carbonates, while the delta 13C of CO2 released at ocean island volcanoes is heavily influenced by subducted organic carbon. Next, carbonates are recycled on the order of tens of millions of years, while organic carbon is released on the order of hundreds of millions of years. So now I'm going to walk you through the model results with some red shadings to help emphasize where the processes are occurring on the schematic and how it translates to the model. So the top panel shows the delta 13C of marine carbonates with natural data in blue and model results in orange. The second panel shows atmospheric oxygen levels through time with estimates, with estimates based on proxy measurements in blue and model results in orange. The third panel shows carbon fluxes from weathering or or carbon burial and different volcanic settings, while the final panel shows K, which is a variable, variable that controls how sensitive continental weathering is to atmospheric CO2. Now K is the only variable we are prescribing changes to in the model to generate the model run shown.
So at 2.4 billion years ago, we increased K, which increases the weathering flux, resulting in increased carbon burial and subduction. This increased carbon burial results in, a, in an increase in oxygen, and shortly after, there's increase <laughs> in the arc CO2 flux due to the release of subducted carbonates. After the initial increase in K, we prescribe K to decay to a lower value. Therefore, the weathering flux also decays. Now the arc flux rapidly responds to the surface ch changes, so the arc flux decays as well. After about 300 million years, the increased flux of organic carbon is released at ocean island volcanoes. And since the arc flux has already decayed, the ocean island flux dominates global CO2 emissions. And this results in a negative carbon isotope excursion, directly following the positive carbon isotope excursion, which has been observed in the natural data. Now we repeat this K increase at 1.4 and 0.8 billion years ago, and the model does a good job of reproducing both the delta 13c and oxygen curve for nearly the entirety of earth history. So I'd like to wrap up by talking a little bit about how this process is related to tectonic cycling. On the right, I added a panel at the bottom that shows how zircon count through t that shows zircon count through time. And zircon is a mineral that is predominantly produced at convergent margins. Therefore, times of high zircon production are thought to signal supercontinent formation, while times of low zircon production are thought to signal supercontinent breakup. I put vertical gray bands, which encompass all periods of enhanced weathering in the model, and we can see that all high weathering periods initiate during troughs in the zircon record, which suggests that supercontinent breakups may be driving time periods of enhanced continental weathering. And there are several reasons that supercontinent breakup may be tied to enhanced weathering. For one, continental breakups are accompanied by the eruption of large volumes of basalts, which are highly weatherable and emit large amounts of CO2, which can also enhance weathering. Second, continental breakup increases the area of continental margins, which are the primary locations for the deposition of organic carbon and carbonates. So, in conclusion, we propose that supercontinent breakups drive enhanced weathering, which leads to enhanced carbon burial, and when this is coupled with a deep carbon cycling, can explain oxygenation, oxygenation events and carbon isotope excursions for the entirety of the Proterozoic.